Um, I'm Ann Kennedy. I'm on the board of Tales of Cape Cod. I'm on the programs committee. Um, I'd like to, right off the bat, tell you about next week. Um, next week we have Andrew Noonan, who has written a book about Bathsheba Spooner, who was the first woman executed in the United States after the Declaration of Independence. She... Um, for inciting, abetting, and procuring the manner and form of murder. So that should be an interesting program, and I hope you all can come. That's next Monday. Uh, this week's sponsors are John and Eliza Lewis, and we'd like to thank them very much for their support. <laughs> so this week, we're very pr privileged to have park ranger, Samantha Gray. She is an interpretive park ranger with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at the Cape Cod Canal. She has worked in the canal for over 25 years, and she manages the canal's interpretive services and outreach programs, as well as the Cape Cod Canal Visitor Center in Sandwich. As an interpreter, Mrs. Ms. Gray reveals and relates the canal's unique history, which includes the history of our unique and iconic bridges, their features, and the operations to people of all ages. For her work, she has been selected by the United States Army Corps of Engineers for multiple awards, including Regional Interpreter of the Year and the American Recreation Coalition's Legends Award. A Ranger Gray earned her degree in conservation of natural resources from Long Island University, and she is a neighbor of ours living in West Barnesville. Welcome, Ranger Gray. I'm vertically challenged. Let me set this up. All right. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. I'm so excited to be part of this series. Um, you know, so much talk in the news the last few years on the future of our bridges, and I just keep thinking how important it is to start reflecting back um, and looking back at the history of our bridges, um, how they came to be, what was here before, what drove them to be what they are now. Um, and, and so this presentation is just that. Before I get into the meat of it, I do work for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, so a quick slide on our agency. We are our nation's engineering organization. We've been around, well, since the Revolutionary War. The first engineering action we had was to build a fortification at Breed's Hill, so Battle of Bunker Hill. Fast forward into the 1800s, country needed engineers to help us grow and expand, and the only engineers Congress had at their disposal were really military ones coming out of West Point. So Congress started authorizing military engineers to do civil works. Fast forward to today, and there's about 35,000 civilians working for our agency doing a little bit of everything. Um, whittle that down, we are there to uh, strengthen our nation's security, enhance our economy, and helping us to prevent, prepare for, or respond to some sort of emergency. And a lot of that work does happen in our nation's waterways, and that is why we are at the Cape Cod Canal. We're heavily involved in navigation. But tonight, I'm here to talk about our bridges, not just these, but these are the ones that we think of when we think of bridges over the Cape Cod Canal. We have our Bourne and Sagamore bridges, and before I really go into detail, do you guys know which one is which? You do? All right. Um, thumbs up if you think the Sagamore is on top. Thumbs down if you think it's on the bottom. Let's test it. All right, we have a few afraid to vote. <laughs> but a lot have, 
Oh, we have some correct, some not correct. The answer is Sagamore's on the top and Bourne is on the bottom. I know. Um, so our bridges are nearly identical. They're continuous truss bridges. Um, so they have truss work. It's continuous. You have a through arch. The roadway goes through the arch. Um, over the waterway, identical. But look at the approaches. The one below is much longer. It's about 1,000 feet longer. That one is the Bourne Bridge. Why is the Bourne Bridge so much longer than the Sagamore? Well, we built the bridges over a canal. We need to provide vertical clearance. And um, well, Sagamore Bridge is built into hills, and the Bourne Bridge is built around really flat land. So it needed a longer approach to get high up in the air. So there's your trick. All right. Now, we cannot forget there's a third bridge that spans the Cape Cod Canal. And you know how it's hard to get trains 135 feet up in the air? Um, engineers designed a movable bridge for the trains to get on and off Cape Cod over the canal. So can I guess that most of you have seen this bridge operate? All right. For those that haven't, this is how it works. Um, there's a whole series of gears underneath the land approaching the bridge that lifts the land up so the train can... No, I'm kidding. All right. You know, that's not true. <clears throat> Sorry, that was an engineer joke. All right, so the entire span lowers down, takes about two and a half minutes for it to get into position. As it lowers, you have um, counterweights that will rise in the towers, and those counterweights are connected to the center span with really large pulleys. That's what resides in the rooms up on top, along with some small motors to make it all work. So everyone here loves history. How many of you have historic homes that have old windows in them with pulleys and weights? All right, we got one. I'm sure some of you have had them. Um, this bridge works exactly the same way, only the center span is 2,200 tons and not a window. All right, so why big bridges? Well, they have to span a canal. This canal is here to provide a safe, navigable shortcut for vessels heading up and down the eastern seaboard. Um, it's burned around for quite some time, and it saves about 135 miles of coastal travel. We have more than 15,000 vessels that go through the canal annually. Um, to, as of now, like more than half of that would be your smaller pleasure craft, a little bit more. But we do have large tug and barge units, car carriers, tankers, cruise ships that go through as well. So these bridges are designed for them. Now, that safe shortcut is not the only reason why the Cape Cod Canal came to be. A huge push for a canal being constructed in this location has to do with this image. This is a 1904 uh, engineering drawing. Um, you can see southeastern Massachusetts, the Cape, the islands, and along the outer shores of Cape Cod, you see all those little dots? Those are all shipwrecks. And that's not all of them. So, you know, you go to the National Seashore, you hear the estimate of 3,000 shipwrecks along the outer shores of the Cape and Islands. Building a canal here was about preventing that hardship, about providing a safer intracoastal route. This was a great area, not only because you could avoid those outer shoals, but nature had done a lot of the work. The valley where the Cape Cod Canal is today already had two rivers flowing through it. On the northeast end was the Scusset River, and that was one of multiple tidal creeks that meandered through that salt marsh. On the southwest end was the Monument River, called the Manumet at some times, Monument at other times, so it had a few different variations. Um, that Monument River connected to Buzzards Bay, and then as you continued upstream, it connected to a freshwater stream called the Herring River that flowed out a Great Herring Pond. So between those two rivers at high tide, we're talking about one mile as the bird flies, about 30 feet above sea level. So a great location to dig a canal. Now the bridges we have in this valley are far from the first bridges that were ever here. You know, these circles represent some of the bridges that were here before. Earliest bridges, I mean, I, I don't even have on record, but surely 
the Herring Pond tribe of the Wampanoag Nation, who had been here for millennia prior to colonists coming, would have some sort of crossing over the Herring River because they had settled and were living and, and thriving in this region. But we go to some of the earlier um, bridges that would be here, say, in the 1700s, and we have a bridge right here that um, was referred to, at least at the time of the canal construction, as the Collins Farm Bridge. And this would have been built 1790s, late 1790s, um, as in the location where the Herring River and the Monument River would meet. There's a passageway underneath, which is super important because you have to allow herring to be able to flow through. But there was a huge farm on both sides of this waterway, and this afforded that passage of, of animals, of, of people, of equipment over, over the waterway. If you are ever driving around the town of Bourne and you find yourself at Old Bridge Road <clears throat> and can't find a bridge, um, this is a photograph of the bridge that used to cross the Monument River at that time. Um, so to give you an idea, um, this is where the Bourne Bridge is now. I just want to make sure my cursor shows up. So this is where the Bourne Bridge is now. If you continue west, which would be heading towards the train bridge, you would encounter Old Bridge Road right over here. And this bridge would allow for small boats, like these rowboats, to be able to go underneath. Beam-style bridge, because that's all that was necessary at that time. You didn't need lift bridges, you didn't need high-span bridges. Then we start talking about the railroad. You know, railroad first came to the Cape in 1848. Um, later on, I believe, was it in the 1870s? I gotta check my notes here. Yep, 1871, the Woods Hole Line was established, and how did trains get to the Woods Hole Line? They would cross over a trestle-style bridge, so that is the photograph on the bottom, and this would be almost right next to where the train bridge is today. A little bit later on, a, another bridge nearby was constructed over the Monument River to allow for pedestrians and carts to cross over. So again, this would be really close to where the train bridge is today. You head towards where that salt marsh was and the Scusset River was flowing, and you had bridges that were more like dams um, and this one is near where Williston Road is in Sagamore, and it's referred to as Willow Dam Road. And all around here would be where Keith Car Works was being established, you know, in the mid-1800s into the early 1900s, a major manufacturing facility for railroad cars in that village. Oh, I should mention here, in this photograph, kind of faded to see, um, would be on the right. What this piece of machinery is, is the very front of a dredge that is about to break through Willow Dam Road, coming from the Cape Cod Bay end and going to cut through inwards as part of the construction of the Cape Cod Canal. So all those primitive bridges that you had over the rivers are now starting to change during this time frame, because starting in 1909, canal construction began with dredges. Um, within the next couple of years, steam shovels were brought in. A lot of dynamiting occurred because of the glacial erratics that were left behind. And then it took about five years for the canal to be constructed, finally opening on July 29th, 1914. Now, the canal opened 1914, you cross over the bridges and you look at the sign, and it says that they opened in 1935. So how did people get on and off Cape Cod prior to 1935? Do we know? Ferry. <gasps> A ferry, like this one? Well, this ferry did exist. 
This is called the Borndale Ferry, and it started its operations in 1914 and carried on um, until the 1930s. Um, how many of you have taken a boat through the Cape Cod Canal? Do you know about how strong, oh, a lot of you. So you know about that strong current? How, how well do you think this boat did? Let's read a little bit. All right, this is Borndale, the Forgotten Village, and this is um, by um, Donald Jacobs. And I have um, just a journal from how well the ferry did. This is, uh, let's see, July 17th through the 23rd, 1914. Monday, ferry refused to do dirty. A uh, dirty, sorry. Ferry refused to do duty. Went on a rampage downstream. Five passengers left on the train. Um, let's see. Tuesday, operator caught by an exposed projecting set screw. Foot injured. Passengers lost train in consequence. Oh, I should mention, when the canal was constructed, the train station that used to be right there in Borndale got moved to the other side of the ditch. Um, so the ferry was necessary for the people on the mainland side to get to the train station on the Cape side. Now, this goes on and on about them um, not doing well. Actually, in August, on August 7th, that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the ferry was ashamed of past record and was on good behavior. But come that Monday, it was tired of being good, backslid, engine refused to work, and passengers for train had to leave. By August 14th, ferry caught fire. All other events insignificant in comparison. Um, often happens to gasoline boats. Fortunately, near the shore, fire was put out with sand. Passengers advised to carry pails of sand in crossing the canal. <laughs> yeah, so the ferry wasn't very reliable. So much so that the local kids used to be able to uh, use it as an excuse for missing school. Yeah. All right, so the ferry did exist, but there were bridges over the Cape Cod Canal when it opened in 1914. They just looked different. This here is the original born bridge over the Cape Cod Canal under construction in 1911. And what it looked like upon completion was this. It was a lift bridge. Uh, the rolling bascule means it has these counterweights at the base of the leaf, you know, or of, of, the, uh, of the draw that helps it like pivot up and down. The roadway was oak planking. Not a lot of people had cars when this was constructed, so there was even a trolley that afforded service between New Bedford and Monument Beach. There was also a Sagamore Bridge, and the Sagamore Bridge was designed in the very same fashion. Now, this one was situated right in the middle of where that Keith Car Works factory was located. So the people in Sagamore, because that was a factory town, could still get back and forth between work and home and church and school. As a matter of fact, during the canal construction, before the Sagamore drawbridge was ready, there was a series of temporary bridges that would have to go into place to allow people to get back and forth. Now, the train bridge was different as well back in 1914. This was a different style lift bridge that had a counterweight, and it would pivot up with two tracks. The counterweight was on the mainland side. What was it like to see these bridges in action? Imagine you were taking a boat through the canal back in the day. Well, you'd be coming in, let's say, from Cape Cod Bay. And here you are, you would see Sandwich on the left-hand side. Um, Sandwich waterfront um, at this time was really a commercial waterfront. There was a lot going on. Um, this was somewhere between 1927 and 1928, just as the government was getting involved. So here's our traffic control boat coming out to meet the sailors. Yeah. And now they're going to pass by some of the industry happening along the Sandwich waterfront, and they're also going to pass some dredge pipes because originally the canal was just constantly under maintenance, didn't have the smooth sides. And now you come up upon the Sagamore drawbridge. 
The mainland side would be on your right, the Cape side on the left. The operator's house is over on the left-hand side near where Keith uh, Car Works would be. In the distance, you can see the, the hills in Borndale. And now the, the sailors are going to make their way towards the middle of the, uh, of the canal near where the herring run is. And you'll see just how much smaller the waterway is, the irregular sides, you know, sand kind of um, eroding in. And you'll get a very quick glimpse of the Borndale Ferry, so don't blink. It's coming up in just a second. There, there it is. Right there. Okay, and now all of a sudden, poof, we're at the Bourne Bridge. But <laughs> on mainland side would be on the right. Um, now, is there a huge car backup? No, there's one car waiting. Are they upset? No, they're getting the baby. They're coming out. They're going to wave hello. Yeah. All right. So anyway, and then beyond that, you could see that the, the train bridge was there. So the Cape Cod Canal was very different in the 1920s. Uh, when that film was taken versus the 2020s. It all started to change in the 1930s, and the catalyst was the government purchasing the Cape Cod Canal through the River and Harbors Act of 1927. And the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers officially took over to operate and improve the canal on March 31st, 1928. And we got a canal that didn't look like the one today. Yet we inherited a canal with some problems. Um, there were significant problems with erosion. Mariners were uh, having trouble with the strong currents in a narrow waterway that was only 100 feet wide. Um, they found that this waterway was too small. They had challenges dealing with the strong currents and the movable bridges. And then on top of that, they had to pay tolls. I'm like, why do you want to pay tolls to wreck when you could go around and wreck for free? So um, there were definitely some challenges. And you saw on the bottom, this steamship that had crashed into, the, crashed into the Sagamore drawbridge. This is the Belfast. This was back in 1919. Um, unfortunately, she was on her first trip of the season. And uh, a stiff current and a stiff breeze brought the bow of the ship underneath the approach of the Sagamore, missing, missing the opening completely. A um, couple of injuries, fortunately, no fatalities. Um, took about uh, 30 hours to clear the ship. So the canal was closed for that time and all traffic was detoured towards the Bourne Bridge. The canal was very different besides being smaller and having those bridges. If you took a boat through Buzzards Bay, it took a series of turns around islands. And so the government, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, is making their long list of things that they need to improve. They're hearing from the delegations of senators and congressmen um, about some of the improvements they'd like to see, like straightening out some of the bends. But also, people were starting to get really concerned about bridge traffic. Those drawbridges by the 19, you know, early 1930s, people had cars then. And sometimes they'd be half hour backups waiting for the drawbridges. So this, this um, complaint about relieving traffic congestion is not a new complaint. That is dated from 1929. All right, so um, US Army Corps of Engineers went back and forth on how they were gonna improve the canal. Ultimately, they decided on taking this small waterway that was uh, financed by August Belmont and turning it, supersizing it, making it a much wider and deeper waterway and lining the sides with rocks to help maintain everything. Now, before they figured out exactly what they were gonna do, they knew they were gonna have to get rid of those drawbridges, and so they had plans to replace the drawbridges. Oh, let me fast forward through that. These are more plans for a navigable waterway. All right, so let's go to the bridges. Um, before the widening, before the deepening, before anything else, they knew they wanted bridges. The, the government tried to propose 
one six-lane bridge um, right down the middle and then a train bridge right next to it to replace all the, the, the two drawbridges. That was met with fierce resistance. Um, and so they went back to having a Bourne, a Sagamore, and a train bridge. Funding for all of this came about under the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933. $4.6 million was issued to widen the canal to 175 feet and to build three bridges at the site. The location for these bridges were to be not at the same place as the drawbridges were. So you look on the left and you see uh, top left corner the Sagamore drawbridge closed and then you see the Sagamore highway bridge. This photograph would have been taken in 1935. How do I know that? Because there are two bridges there. Part of the contract is once you build the bridge you, and have it operational, you dismantle the other one. You look at the photograph on the right, and there are four bridges in this photograph. There are two Bourne bridges and two railroad bridges, though they're not fully completed. All right, so what are we looking at? The Bourne bridge is open and operational in the foreground. The drawbridge from the Bourne is already starting to be dismantled. Further beyond in the photograph, the train bridges were not completed until almost six months later than the Bourne Bridge. So all I see here are the towers of our current train bridge with the original train bridge in place. So all of these photographs were taken in 1935. All right, I want to fast forward to a couple of notes here. All right, so construction began December 8th, 1933 on the highway bridges. And as I mentioned earlier, the bridges are nearly identical in design. Um, and they opened in 1935. I guess the thing to mention in December 8th, 1933, that was a really cold winter. So cold that the government actually abandoned thoughts about building locks to solve the problems of the strong current because everything froze over. So imagine working on the bridges in, in the winter of 33 into 34. Um, I guess the foreman had mentioned on the train bridge that 18 people got frostbite. Here's some photographs of the Bourne Bridge under construction. And they did, both. so imagine all three bridges working, you know, being constructed simultaneously, and there were teams working from the mainland side and from the Cape side towards each other. And this, these happen to be a series of the Bourne Bridge under construction. Yeah, you didn't know the, the bridges were suspension bridges, too, did you? Mm. And then here are the train, here's a couple of photographs of the train bridge under construction. Um, train bridge was a little bit different than the highway bridges because there was so much extra weight involved when you're dealing with the counterweights and the railroad tracks. So the engineers had to sink like pilings down like 62 feet below sea level to be able to support the towers that had the counterweights. And as you probably know, Cape Cod was formed by glaciers and left behind a lot of debris in the form of boulders. And so to build the railroad bridge, 350 tons of rock had to be blasted out of it to be able to drive the sheeting down, to create the coffer dams, to build the piers. So it was some tough work. And they started in December of 33 as well. What I find fascinating with this is these bridges were constructed during the Great Depression. Um, and I'll go into more detail in a second. Uh, but for the train bridge, it was determined that, that the canal were to stay open through it all, and, except for five days. And this photograph on the top right is pretty much right around the five days. Um, because the way that they constructed it, they built a center span 
from the mainland side, center span from the Cape side, and then lowered everything down and then had five days to complete the center. And then it lifted in September of 1935. All right, let's talk about when this work was done and who did it because this was during the Great Depression and a lot of people were out of work. Now the funding came through the National Industrial Recovery Act and in accordance with the Federal Emergency Administration of Public Works, so the PWA, uh, work was to be distributed as widely as possible. Towns had lists of men that were available and able to work. All men and born were first offered the jobs, then it was expanded to Sandwich, Falmouth, and Barnstable, and, and then eventually all of the Cape, Wareham, and Plymouth. Anyone who wanted and were able to work. There were four shifts per bridge. So you had two shifts that were five-hour shifts, two shifts that were six-hour shifts. So this went well into the night. There were floodlights, year-round hard work. Hand labor was preferred to machine labor to maximize the number of people that you were hiring. So nights and winters, they were worked. And um, as I mentioned earlier, 19 men reported fro getting frostbitten on the railroad bridge construction that very first winter. Must have gotten paid well then, huh? Let's see what they got. We had a little more than 700 people employed on the bridges. Double that when you start looking at the canal's entire reconstruction. All right, so here's payday. What's everyone getting paid? Well, if you were unskilled, you got at least 50 cents an hour. Skilled labor, as much as a buck 20 an hour. Though I did see somewhere a hoisting engineer was getting paid a buck 33 an hour. Um, and I also read a carpenter who was getting 90 cents an hour and thought that was pretty good, but then some out of town guys with a union went on strike for a week to, to get that raised um, up a little bit more. So this was the pay, and this was really important because not only are these families getting the money that they need, then all of these people are then reinvesting that money into their communities and helping everyone else out. The con construction of the bridges was an exciting time for people that needed work. It was an exciting time with the thought of, of how they were replacing these old bridges. Um, there was a lot of excitement about how these new bridges were going to allow people to cross the canal with greatest of ease. Like here in the Boston Globe in 1935, it's really hard to read that, so I'll, I'll, I'll expand it. it. They declare no more traffic jams going to the Cape. There it is, in black and white. Yeah. Yeah, so there was much excitement for this. And compared to the drawbridges, yes, yeah, these are supersized. There were gonna be no more delays from the ships going through the canal. Now, as good as the bridges were, they did take a toll. Um, men did lose their lives in construction on these bridges, as was the case with so many New Deal projects in the 1930s. Uh, three, men's lost, three men lost their lives during the bridge construction, one at each bridge. At Sagamore, there was a diver that was cutting off piles beneath the water, and, and one of those pilots fell across his airline. Born, there was a where staging accident where four men fell 70 feet. I don't know how only one died in that incident. And then at the railroad bridge, there was a timekeeper that fell 40 feet into the pier and suffered fatal injuries. And, and then the next sentence is, thus the human toll of bridge building. Um, our standards have changed so much. We couldn't imagine anyone dying in a bridge construction project. But then they didn't have OSHA. They didn't have fall protection. It was estimated that there would be a death for every million spent. Um, very, very different times. Well, to pivot that sad moment into a celebration, there was a huge celebration for the opening of the bridges. 
I mean, so much, you know how we love parades? Well, this one was a supersized parade. This was a five mile long parade that took people <laughs> over the Bourne Bridge, along the entire scenic highway, and then back over the Sagamore Bridge. There were 8,000 people marching in that parade. The governor cut the ribbon on the Bourne Bridge. Mrs. Belmont the, of August Belmont, the, the, the head financier of the original Cape Cod Canal, she cut the ribbons on the Sagamore Bridge. Um, it was a, a the, the, the parade was on a Saturday, um, but there was uh, three days of celebrations between balls and baseball games and, uh, and band competitions. Um, there were big awards for best, best band and best, um, and best floats. Um, they even had aerial exhibitions before the parade by squadrons of the Army, the Navy, and the National Guard. And, you know, I have people that will ask me, has anyone ever flown underneath one of those bridges? Well, Lieutenant Crocker Snow did. There he goes. Yeah. Yeah, so this was a huge celebration. Now, I hate to, like, fast forward so fast, but I want to make sure that I have time, you know, to answer questions. So... A lot has happened since 1935 with our bridges. Um, you, you do go to today, and we have 35 million vehicle trips annually. Uh, the promise from the uh, Boston Globe of no more Cape traffic is not true. Uh, <laughs> um, now, these bridges are 88 years old, and there's a lot to them. You have all of the steel work, so all the steel work, that's your truss, are all just members riveted together with gusset plates. There were no machine-made bolts that made in bulk, you know, during the 1930s. You had riveters up there. So there's steel. There are concrete piers that hold the structure up and, uh, and concrete abutments that hold it in. There's all sorts of uh, you know, road work, there's, there's so many different parts to these bridges and they all need to be maintained. So how do we make sure that bridges that are 88 years old are safe? Well, um, you will on occasion, once every two years for each bridge, see people with their arrest, fall arrest equipment on all over those bridges surveying them. So they are doing inspections within arm's reach of everything, looking at paint, rust, corrosion, section loss, cracks, bending, anything and everything. They're looking at the steel, they're looking at the concrete, they're looking at things that you cannot see to see how things are and what needs to be maintained. And based on what they find, based on what is recommended routine maintenance, based on the budget, um, maintenance is done. And we do that. We do painting all the time. You know, right? You, you know when we're doing work. <laughs> um, we have a little bit of everything that's going on. So painting is not like painting your home. It's a little bit more complicated because you're at height, there's staging involved, um, there's you know, containment that needs to happen, there's a quick movement that needs to, be hap needs to happen because if you were to sandblast the steel down to bare metal and leave it for too long, you're gonna get a flash rust. So you have to recover that quickly. The paint is not just to look good, it's to, to protect the integrity of the steel. Um, there are crews that are maintaining pavement, um, updating lights and electrical, working on concrete. And concrete work is what we were doing on the Sagamore Bridge, what was that, in last spring and what will be happening on the Bourne Bridge um, next. Um, there are expansion joints. Those are really long structures that face heat and cold and lots of load in terms of traffic to not so much. They need to be able to flex. So we have what are called expansion joints and other movable parts that allow that. And those need to be replaced every once in a while. Now, the challenge that we have and that you see as we're replacing them is that we have a lot of users on those bridges. So we will take one third the bridge 
to do the work, well, one third allows for traffic off the Cape and one third allows for traffic on the Cape. This is challenging for the commuters using the bridge. It's challenging for the contractors trying to be safe while they're doing their work. Uh, nothing like having your head right next to that cone, right next to a tire going by. So it's very challenging work. Now, back in the day when we did maintenance, let's say in the 50s, 60s, maybe even 70s, it wasn't as challenging, yet we didn't have the same sort of <laughs> equipment and tools, but we would just post some signs. You know, these are old signs that, you know, I, I found, able to get pictures of, bridge closed, go to the other bridge. And then you just resurface the roadway when you need to. Just like in these photographs here. Now, these aren't even major work. Was anyone around here uh, around this time? I see, yep, I see a hand right there. This, so our bridges are designed that, and a lot of structures are that, you know, every 50 years or so, you need to do some major rehabilitation to keep them functionally and structurally sound. And we did that for our highway bridges. Bourne Bridge was 1979 to 1981, and then the Sagamore Bridge followed. And during these rehabs, the entire roadway was removed. You know, you think of the, the pavement as sitting on this decking, which has like concrete filled steel grating. Well, all that had to be removed to get down to the stringers and the beams, basically the stuff that crisscrosses and supports the bridge. Um, to make sure that all of that steel was repaired and then put the road back. When this happened, we were detouring traffic to the other bridge. Um, now, what's scary is, or not scary, but what's challenging to think is that as the bridges approach 100, that triggers another 50-year rehab. So are we going to do this again, or are we not? So in the late teens, um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers engaged in a multi-year engineering study to determine, are we going to do a major rehabilitation, or is it time to do something different? And that study was published in 2020, and it said it's time to replace them, and it recommended replacing them. Now, since 2020, a lot has happened. I have Cape Cod Bridges program, and then I have Mass DOT after it. Since then, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has partnered with MassDOT, uh, Federal Highways Administration, and MassDOT is actually going to be taking the lead on the construction of new bridges and roadways around the canal to improve the movement of multimodal transportation. And of course, that leads to all sorts of questions. What are they going to look like? Where are they going to go? When are they going to be built? What will the roads around the bridges look like, and how much will it cost? Um, this presentation is about the past, and not about the future. So though there's some stuff up on this website, mass.gov, I really can't tell you all the details about the future because they're still being worked on. So if you want to keep in touch and figure out or, 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 or leave a comment, Go to mass.gov, and in the search, you could just put Cape Bridges. And that's when you can find out about what they're doing, get the latest updates, where we are in the process, and also leave comments, suggestions, concerns. Now, if you want to know a little bit more about the past, or a little bit more about how we operate the uh, canal today, you should come visit me at the Cape Cod Canal Visitor Center. This is located in Sandwich in a 1930s era Coast Guard boathouse. Um, we are open um, through October 21st. We are free. I know I see some familiar faces here that have been to the Visitor Center, but if you haven't, come on by and check out our exhibits. And with that, I think my timing is, oh yeah, pretty good. All right, so I want to thank you and open up for questions and stories. All right, what do we got? Yes. When you dredged the canal, mm -hmm. where did all that material go? 
Oh, that's a great question. All right, so dredging the canal. Now, the canal was built not just once, but twice. And millions of cubic yards of material, where did it go? The best answer is a little bit here and a little bit there. All right, so, um, you know, we really value the importance of wetlands today. Um, then they, it was undervalued. So a lot of it was put on the sides to fill in low-lying land. Um, some of it was towed out to sea. Um, some of it you just kind of see up on the hills along the side. So, I mean, if you're really good at reading the landscape as you walk along the canal, there's some parts of the canal that look like typical New England woods. You're going to find your rocks and whatnot. And then others that you're like, this is pretty sandy. Well, I don't see a lot of rocks right here. And, and that will be your dredge spoil. Now, during the reconstruction in the 1930s, some of the material was used out in Buzzards Bay. So for those that boat through Buzzards Bay, you'll notice off of the Wareham side Stony Point Dyke, which is a two mile long, um, yeah, I bet you I have a photo. Pictures are so much better. You have one, okay. Do I have one? I think I do. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this um, this this little peninsula right here is uh, human made. So that is with dredged spoil, and that is to help control the cross currents and the approach channel in Buzzards Bay. On this side here, you see what looks like kind of like a little doorknob and another bump, and then skinny pieces of land. Those were used to be islands, Mashney Island and Hog Island, and those were connected with dredge spoil, also to help allow for a nice straight approach in from Buzzards Bay. When the canal originally opened, um, it did not start all the way down here at Cleveland Ledge Light. It started off of Wings Neck up here. Oh, my my mouse isn't even showing up, is it? I'm like I'm like on my screen, like pointing at everything. All right, that's Stony Point Dyke. Those are the islands. The original canal used to come up this way, cut through Finney's Harbor, and then make a right. Because that island up here was so big it almost touched Wareham. And the government just cut it in half, you know. So anyway, yeah, best answer, a little here, a little there. Okay. Yeah. I believe sandwich, uh, pea sandwich, and the beaches along there were mostly sand. Now there's a lot of rocks in there. The rocks are mostly, or I would say, are glacial in origin. The sand is what's migrating away from what's underneath. So it is, here's my Cape Cod map. All right, so it, natural longshore migration of sand will come down like this and head out like that because of the way the currents move, the wind moves. This is down Cape, sand goes that way. Well, when you start having structures along the shore that will disrupt the longshore migration of sand, you might have more accumulation of sand over here than you will over here. And so basically what's happening is sand, it keeps moving, and the rocks underneath are left behind. Does that seem... Okay, okay. Yeah, now we will be dredging, I believe, this winter. And when we do, um, Town of Sandwich has a permit, you know, and funding set up to receive sand for a Town Neck Beach for, for nourishment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know of any study of the how the canal would change, you know, just the obviously opened up very large, very fast. Sure. Obviously coming up, it's going to be kind of Sure. There's kind of I'm I'm sure there's some local um localized impacts. Um, that have changed things, um, but I, I don't know of any. I don't know of any studies. I mean, it's it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of interesting when you start looking to now you open up the waterway. Not only can boats use the shortcut, but migrating fish can. Yeah. 
you know, and so you start seeing those striper runs and bluefish runs. I see whales in the canal, and you think about like, you know, th there's now this deep water flow pulling in the base of the food, you know, starting with the plankton and then, and then the smaller fish and the bigger fish. And so um, the canal might impact some structural features, but at the same time will also impact, you know, where wildlife can go and live and thrive or not. Yeah, so there was always the question of eminent domain and issues like that. So the idea of a canal was dated so far back. Um, there were surveys through this valley. First survey was Revolutionary War. First, uh, uh, you know, and surveys continue in, into the 1800s. There were a couple companies that actually had attempts in constructing the canal in the 1880s. Um, and so a lot of the real estate had been purchased prior and kind of packaged together. But then for the companies, these were private companies getting a charter to construct a canal, um, they would get eminent domain rights, you know, as part of it too. But they had to offer like fair market value and, and whatnot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any numbers, dollar numbers, you know, uh, calculated to what kind of revenue comes through the canal each year? Yes. Do I know it? No. <laughs> but no. <laughs> I don't know it, but uh, yeah, so like, I mean, I think, I feel like every agency has to like crunch numbers and estimate value and data. So that the must, I, I, I'm, I'm positive it exists. I just don't know. Mm. Yeah, I, well, because I, I'm not the money person. <laughs> um, yeah, Google, right? <laughs> Good question. I'll let me see if I can look a few things up, and I can share with you after. Yeah, um, I feel I feel like I'm supposed to know, but I, I don't. <laughs> Shame. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. It was just a story, but um, my father grew up in Saugus, and he eventually ended up on the land in East Sandwich. He remembers as a boy his father um, taking all the kids in the car and his parents came down to go over the bridge. It wasn't for the celebration, but it was soon after because it was such a cool thing. It's such a big such deal. Such an amazing thing. And he'd always talk about that. Yeah, I and love it. that was when he was a kid. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big deal. You know, I've um, I tried to get additional videos, and I'm I'm really bummed that I couldn't have those for tonight. Of you know, people walking over the bridge on that opening day, all locked arms. The sidewalks looked huge, which I know they're exactly the same. It's just because the cars were 1930s cars and not the trucks we see today. Um, I do need to note that even the 1930s, people still drove over the lines. They didn't stay in lane then, even with the <laughs> <laughs> Um But yeah, it was, it was such a big deal to come down and see that, um, to see um, the, the boats go through the canal, the big ships like the, the Boston and the New York uh, passenger ships. Oh, one newspaper article I read, which I thought was interesting, this was before the Bourne Bridge was completed, but uh, Bourne police noting a new problem with these elevated bridges. And those were, um, those were boys throwing things off of the bridge onto the steamships as they went by, trying to get it to land in their smokestacks. <laughs> so they were gonna have to station a police officer on the bridge when those ships went by. That was in the article. I'm like, of course. <laughs> Um, that, it, I don't know if, if that was off the island, like off the vineyard or something. I don't know the story of that, but it's too big to come through the Cape Cod Canal. I, yeah, I don't think so. Um. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, so 
Basically, how, how the boat, how it works going through the canal, once you're over 65 feet in length, you have to contact a marine traffic controller prior to entry, and they work for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They operate like air traffic control, but marine. And um, it's from there, they'll coordinate everything, uh, making sure that we know what the tides are doing, what the currents are doing, how everything is going to fit. Um, how everyone's going to pass each other. Um, if you're smaller than 65 feet, then yeah, as the captain, you want to be able to go through with the current. So it's up to you to, to, to look at those tides. And NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, has tides and currents predicted years out. So you can look and they'll tell you, you know, predicted speed on this day with an ebb flow will be this. So um, if you're small, you've got to calculate it on your own. If you're a large ship, then our controllers are, are part of those calculations. You guys? Oh. Was Bass River ever considered as a location for the canal? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, I think that was the, the federal surveys that were done in 1824-ish. Um, so yeah, this we're talking 1820s canal building boom in the U.S. and multiple locations in in the Cape and southeastern Massachusetts were considered for a canal. Uh, you had what is technically the first Cape Cod Canal considered, which is what is that Jeremiah's Ditch gutter, the one that goes through uh, like Rock Harbor. It would come out. Uh, near where the Orleans Rotary is. So that ditch was used, I believe, during the War 1812. So that location was considered. Bass River was con seriously considered because there was a good water route through. Um, I think that was eventually abandoned because of the terminal moraine, you know, how much land and how big they were going to have to cut through to get to the Cape Cod Bay side. Um, of course, where the canal is now, that area was studied a lot. Some variability on what, what river they came in. And then I thought a really interesting alternative was one coming up Narragansett Bay and going up the Taunton River and coming out in Quincy for like a 26-mile canal. So, so a bunch of those were all surveyed and considered. We won. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. All right, thank you.